This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We work with some of the world's leading companies to help people get stuff done, but more importantly, to help people to make space for what matters. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Dr. Grace Lorden. Grace is an Associate Professor in Behavioural Science at LSE, and she's the Founding Director of the Inclusion Initiative. She's also the author of Think Big, which is all about how to create a framework that will move you towards your goals. In this episode, we talk about how to think big, as well as tips for when not to listen to your mentor, the reasons some people succeed and others don't, overcoming procrastination, diversity, having a growth mindset, and much more. This is Dr. Grace Lorden. So we've just been battling some morning tech gremlins and I'm with Dr. Grace Lord and how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad that scary echo is gone. I, you know, I've been told I have an annoying voice before, but that takes it to a whole new level, I think. <laughs> so top, top tip for uh, crowdcast and podcast platforms and stuff is if you've got more than one window open, they will start talking to each other and we end up in outer space. But, but here we are. Uh, so yeah really lovely to talk to you we're going to talk about your book as well um, I wanted to start with your day job yes um, so associate professor of behavioral science at LSE um, which so- sounds very grown up and important um, and also the founding director of the inclusion the inclusion initiative um, so I wanted to start with that part if that's okay um, so you've talked a lot about um, using behavioural science to aid inclusive work cultures. And I wondered if you wanted to just start by just talking a little bit about what that project is aiming to do and some of the detail behind it, because some of the projects that you guys are, are running there at LSE is really fascinating. So I just wanted to hear a bit more about that. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for the longest time, Graham, I, um, I've, I've worked with people who make high stake decisions. And, and I kind of started doing this with people who are actually choosing companies for concentrated portfolios. So they might want to invest in, you know, five companies. So obviously the fifth then becomes very important for for their decision-making. And I have kind of, I think, the privilege of both studying their decision-making and also kind of intervening to change how people would do things. And and one thing, and it's really obvious when I say it, that that really helps in that process, is that if you have people around the table who have different perspectives and who are actually willing to share that hidden information. And the second part doesn't always happen because as humans, we tend to fall into group think. And as I've kind of advanced that, the value of inclusion has become really, really salient to me. Um, And running next to that, because I study behavioral science and I teach this course called decision making, I used to get asked to talk a lot to diversity, about diversity and inclusion in companies and how we can advance it. And very often I was kind of saying, things to people that might have actually made them feel uncomfortable. For example, you're spending an awful lot of money on your diversity inclusion agenda and things really haven't moved in the company. Don't you want to kind of, don't you want to question why that is? Um, and the two really came together quite forcefully in that I think through thinking about high stakes decision making and the value of inclusion, for me, the value of inclusion and diversity. And I, and I put those the other way around on purpose to kind of emphasize that we have to include these um, um, diverse voices to make them um, good for business. But for me, the inclusion and diversity was really worth having from a business perspective. Um, and I think secondly, I learned a lot about how to kind of get there on the, on the micro level. And that was initially what the inclusion initiative was meant to be about. It was really meant to be about thinking you know, or what are the interventions that I know know let's tell companies about them let's tell them how they can evaluate them help them if that's what they want us to do and then we can actually learn about what interventions work in what context and what are these kind of core messages for inclusion yeah. The second part, which has actually dominated my time in the last few months, is thinking about this from a macro perspective, because, of course, there's a lot of companies. And I think we learned this in Black Lives Matter, if you really look closely, there's a lot of companies who talk about diversity and inclusion, 
but they don't really care about diversity and inclusion. So it's kind of words before actions. And what we really want to do now alongside the micro stuff with the companies who, who are embracing this kind of evaluative approach is measure inclusion using data external to the company. So things like Twitter, job ads, um, you know, Glassdoor, uh, newspaper, um, uh, news, newspaper reporting. And with that measure, put it out in the public forum to investors because we know it's linked to behavioral risk and we hope to show give, give more evidence of that. Um, to customers, because we know customers are becoming much more socially responsible and then kind of moving the companies who are a bit kind of slow on this path to embracing um, inclusion and diversity. And that's really our research. So we do these kind of micro classic behavioral science type interventions. And then alongside that, we have this project where we're trying to measure inclusion from a macro perspective and put that out in, put that out so that people can actually it can help their decisions. So it can, it can, an investor might say, actually, this company is a bad bet. They're not inclusive now. I think they're sitting on a lot of behavioral risk. I'm going to choose another way. Or a customer, when they're choosing their brands, if it's salient to them, what companies are actually treating their employees well and what companies really take, you know, curbing sexism, racism, um, and other types of discrimination in the workplace seriously, they might choose to buy their products. And that's kind of the big vision uh, for it in, in, in five years' time. Nice. And we're obviously putting this out in International Women's Month. And yes. um, it feels like there's, it feels like one of the things that really happened through Black Lives Matter was a recognition that there's, you know, there's people who are racist, but then there's also structural racism, right? Yeah. And so structural racism being a more difficult thing sometimes to see, a more difficult thing to define. And obviously the same thing happens around issues with gender. So do you want to just talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the biases that are really upholding structural sexism or, or stru structural issues around gender and inclusion generally? I mean, I think it's a really so. So what we're trying to do with the inclusion issue for the moment is really figure out what are the obstacles that face people who have different traits that go beyond gender, because I think in some ways, I feel I know a lot about what can actually advance women in the workplace. So when you ask me that question, a lot of my answer will be driven by what we've learned from studying gender at the average, mostly in, in Western educated, industrialized rich countries, and mostly in kind of the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. So that really does mean, mean white women. Um, so I can talk to you about familiarity bias, for example. So I can say to you, you know, we tend to prefer to hire people like ourselves. And in general, you know, men might prefer the company of men and women might prefer the company of women. But I think what it really means is actually when we're hiring an additional woman, we're always at risk of choosing somebody who's familiar to the group that's already there in the first place. And then if we yeah. think about diversity, that's problematic. Um, or I could talk to you about, you know, statistical discrimination. And I can say to you, um, if we think about women, for example, who might come back from maternity leave very, very quickly, what we see in particularly in financial professional services, which I know incredibly well, is they tend to still get sidetracked um, as if they have taken a back seat, even if they have their husband who's working at home and even if they have structures in place that they actually are able to go back to work full time. And kind of that's kind of the statistical discrimination, the idea that we apply the average to the group. And I think all of those hold for other types of people in society. But I think where we have a lot of learning to do is really to understand from people themselves, firstly, what's the obstacles that they believe that are holding them back and then fitting it into the theory that we that we know well. And, you know, I'll give an example kind of of, of, of what we're trying to do um, in, in a project that's actually starting around International Women's Day is we're going to do a study just of black women who are working in financial professional services mm -hmm. and big tech. And we've chosen to look at, at, at these women, because if you look at the Labour Force survey in Britain, out of every group where, where you take an intersection of um, age, where you take an intersection of race or where you take an intersection of gender, they are doing the worst, conditional on all the things that economists would usually condition on. So education, types of education, where they happen, happen to live. Um, and I think, you know, the danger for me talking about the obstacles for these women is that I fit the obstacles that I've learned about from an entirely different average mm. to this group. 
And I think there's a lot from at this point from just going with open ears and talking to them and then backward fitting those insights into the behavioral insights that we have already. So the popular biases that your listeners would have heard about, you know, familiarity bias, similarity bias, fundamental attribution error, they would all hold in this study. But my 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 guess is what we'll get from actually um, talking to women is unique obstacles that we haven't necessarily thought about just because we've always evaluated things in behavioral science and in economics at the average. Yeah. And when you do that, you kind of really discount the experiences of groups. And, and, you know, if you look at statistics, some of these groups are actually being held behind much more than the average. Yeah. And you, you, re, you reel off those biases really quickly there. Tell us a bit more about fun, fundamental attribution error. So fundamental. So I always, um, when I'm teaching this in, in my class, I always talk about um, imagine yourself going to work. Can you imagine it? Because we've been in lockdown so far. I need to update my idea. But imagine yourself going to work on a day that's really rainy and there's lots of puddles along the road and a driver speeds past you and they splash you with a puddle. So most of us will swear at the driver. Um, people who don't tend to swear, they'll say, what the fudge? But you usually will carry it, maybe for five minutes, maybe for an hour. You might find yourself kind of telling your partner about it and reliving you know, the anxiety of, 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 of being splashed over and over again. And I think what we're really doing is we're assuming that the act of the driver splashing us in that puddle means something about their character. So we don't stop to think about, for example, why they might be speeding. Maybe they were rushing to hospital because somebody was sick or maybe they've been unemployed for a long time and they've slept out for an interview. And if I gave you that context, you start to feel much more sympathetic to them. Now, when I use that example, I normally say you should start strudging off being splashed by a puddle because there's no use in handling that anger. It's not good for your resilience. But it also tells you something about the fundamental attribution error. When we have encounters with people who we don't know or people who aren't familiar to us in the sense that we don't have a connection with them, and there's an incident, whether they splash us with a puddle, whether they're rude to us, whether they treat us badly in a particular particular moment, uh, perhaps they shrug us off or don't answer our email, we tend to attribute it to their character. So it's a fixed trait about them. But when the boot's on the other foot, if it's my partner, if it's my dad, if it's mm -hmm. my friend, if it's me, I tend to attribute it to luck most often. And, you know, the fundamental attribution error is actually very powerful in explaining how we discount people who might be unfamiliar to us. So you might, for example, take somebody who doesn't match your demographics. And when they come into an interview, you might actually have a lot in common with them outside their skills, talent and ability of the job. But the danger is that in that interaction, you'll start attributing things to their character, which really sit outside the situation that you should be evaluating for. Mm, interesting. Um, you also have, have done a lot of work around um, the finance industry and looking at biases there. And I saw a thing, a, a talk that you did where you were talking about a couple of different character traits, including the uh, appetite for risk in different, yes. in different sectors and, and kind of saying that... Um, in general, and there will always be specific differences, but in general, men have a higher appetite for risk and women less so. And so then in the finance sector, if risk is something that's really valued, then that skews the culture in one direction versus the other. So what what do you see as the, the benefit there to diversity? Because it feels to me like that just gets you into groupthink very quickly, right? So you do, and I mean, yeah. it gets you—it gets you into trouble, right? So you could actually say that this, these kind of big risks, you know, the, the, these big risks that people were taking in situations where they shouldn't be taking, was the cause of the GFC. If you wanted to kind of, you know, narrow narrow it down to yeah. one cause, and I think you know, finance is, is really interesting in that risk is rewarded in the jobs that you might expect it to. So, for example, if you're a high frequency trader. Everything is done on almost your instantaneous P&L. And then everything is down to what did you do in the last year? So what was your performance in the last year? Um, and you can imagine, actually, if you if you take a, a kind of a proper kind of risk adjustment approach to this, actually, if you as a man take much more risk than me and me as a woman take much less risk. But over 10 years we end up with kind of the same performance. Matching mm. us in a team makes a lot of sense, right? Because on the years where you're actually having a down period, my sensibility will actually kind of keep us so we're able to kind of smooth profits over kind of over, yeah. o over that window. And a lot of people who push for moving these windows from one year in financial professional service are really thinking about that. So, you know, it, 
I always kind of say in behavioral science, we have what I call a stop and a flow of knowledge. So a flow are these kind of interesting biases that come up or these interesting stylized findings that people will, will, will say to me, this is what's happening in the literature now. But we don't really have the stock of evidence. We definitely have the stock of evidence to say that men and women have different risk aggression parameters. Um, but I think outside of those roles where we're actually um, where we're, we're taking these risks, something really interesting has happened in that people who tend to be much more risk loving, put themselves forward when they don't necessarily have the credentials will take a punt are also disproportionately rewarded in the non-income generating roles and that's yeah. quite fascinating so you might kind of say look if we want to take if, if if shareholders are impatient a short perspective makes sense um but i think in the non-income generating roles we don't have the um we don't have the rationale for it and you know people who kind of have thought about this would say actually if the environment is grown around people where we have the short run perspective it's no surprise the types of personalities the types of personalities thrive and you know one of the problems with this is if i am risk averse and I don't put my hand in the ring often enough for promotion or I don't put my hands in the ring often, you know, if, if, if I don't ask for pay rise when I'm due a pay rise, if I want to be 120 percent of the criteria rather than 100 percent. But the risk loving people are going in the opposite direction. You will see these kind of big problems like gaps in pay, gaps in promotion and gaps of who actually sits at the top. Because, you know, most of the time, like when I put myself forward for anything, the chances of me being um, accepted are never zero. So in, in essence, if you have skills, talent and ability, um, even if they don't match the role that you're actually going for, a risk loving person is, is much more likely to get it because they'll be putting their hat in the ring uh, much more often. And, you know, I always kind of say this is a culture that, that, that I really see in financial and professional services, but you see it in a lot of other industries as well. And, you know, within financial and professional services, there are teams and groups that are better and that are worse. And it's interesting to contrast them. Um, and I think a lot does come down. I mean, you asked about inclusion. I think a lot does actually come down um, to the leader and the leader's ability to really strip out these kind of traits of a person. How risk loving are they? You know, are they confident? Are they extrovert from skills, talent and ability, which isn't easy when output is not measured um, that clearly. But I don't think it's as difficult as what we all sometimes say that it is. Yeah, I, I've been saying this to a few people for a while. I, I feel like there's there's a sort of missed conversation around diversity of, of thinking and sort of styles of thinking. So like we talk a lot about diversity of people, but actually one of the big values of diversity is that, that you know, that, that we do better when we have a broader diversity of thinking yeah. in the room. And we need to think about that even if it's, you know, uh, you know, like we need to think about that in, in, a, in a team, whatever the, uh, you know, the gender makeup or the ethnic makeup is. We just need to be thinking about that more as, how to make more balanced teams, right? I think if you, if I mean, if, if you push the diversity argument, that's the only reason that we care about diversity. So, for example, if I take a colleague of mine who grew up on the other side of the world, they had a very different cultural experience to me. Mm. We happen to both study economics. We are going to we are going to come at it from two different angles. So us as a combination is going to be much more powerful than me just working with the colleagues who have adapted to the same environment as, as myself. So for me, diversity is really only a pulse point for what you just described, diversity of thinking. So all of the evidence that we have that says diversity is good from business comes from diverse thinking and having people who have these different perspectives. The pulse point comes from the fact that in general, we would we would expect somebody, people of different races to have different backgrounds. You would think people of different gender to have, you know, different life experiences. But of course, that doesn't always hold up. And, you know, people who are uh, kind of frustrated with the pro progress of gender will point to the fact that actually types of women who didn't represent the diverse thinking have gotten ahead in some industries. Um, and that actually explains why we don't have to trickle down to other women. Because I guess when you want to be kind of pushing people forward, what you really want are two things, diverse thinking, which you've picked out, but also a person who embraces the idea that diverse thinking is good for business. So they're bringing along people who otherwise, who, who, who otherwise would be left behind. Um, yeah. But but very often, and, and I find this myself, I'm doing kind of qualitative um, research now to expand the inclusion initiative into New York. And very often we start the conversation with diverse thinking and we, we, we drift into gender because when people think about diversity, they think about gender. So I think you know, I would implore your listeners to really move to 
gender is a pulse point for diverse thinking. And what we need are men and women who actually have kind of have faced different life experiences and bring different and bring different thoughts to the table. Yeah. And it feels to me like once we do that, it actually just it catapults the the whole um, agenda around gender and race and everything else, because people will just be driven. Even the people who are reluctant to change become more incentivized to change as a result of that. So that, that feels like a really important conversation to be having. Um, let's talk about your book, um, Think Big. Um, so let's uh, start with I'm going to start with a couple of big questions, seeing as the book is called Think Big. Um, so what does it mean to think big and act small? Oh, so um, essentially the the whole idea behind the book is for I, I think it's kind of for people like me who can't afford to kind of upend their life, but are quite ambitious in their career. So um, it's really about getting people and there's a whole chapter devoted to this, getting people to think big about what they want to actually end up doing so what's kind of the kind of the the kind of the the, the, the blue sky thinking um as it were setting a goal that's based on activities so that's kind of getting you to kind of really think small actually to think about what do i actually enjoy doing on a day-to-day basis kind of a self-check to see if you're if you're um if the goal that you've chosen is the right one and then also identifying small steps that you will commit to to getting you there and the whole idea behind the small steps is in the flavor of behavioral science we've shown a number of times that if we take small steps consistently, they will have disproportionate effects on these kind of big life outcomes that we have. Um, and I think, you know, for me, when I was kind of starting out and I would, I would I would really try to kind of go for something and I would go for it quickly, I would very often end up failing. And then when I would fail, I would kind of tell myself, well, maybe I'm not cut out for it. So I talk a lot about narratives in the book, but this idea that, you know, we have these kind of stories that we tell ourselves in the words of, of, of Brene Brown, and then the, those stories actually kind of decide what we what we end up doing with our lives. And for me, committing to very, very quick overhauls of my life never worked out for me. And this is for somebody who kind of says, I want to have big changes in my life. I want to have them in a reasonable period of time. So we're talking kind of one year to five years, but you're not going to wait forever. And in between, I want to take these small steps that actually I will enjoy some of those small steps, but I would commit to that. So I get to my end goal in one year and five years. And, you know, kind of following this plan is ultimately how I actually um, wrote the book, um, yeah. which I will tell you, by the way, I'm still worried that my dad is going to be the only person who will read it, which is at the 25th. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to be on here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just about kind of reframing how we think about big achievements. And, and, and demonstrating through behavioral science that it's possible to have big achievements if you're a bit more patient with yourself and you commit to very, very small changes um, every week. So it doesn't even have to be daily every week. So I wanted to ask you a question that is, I guess this is as much to do with your day-to-day -day work as it is the book, but, you know, really small question. Why do some individuals succeed in life and others don't? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think in a perfect world, Graham, you know, people would succeed based on skills, talent and ability. Um, and I think, you know, the small steps that you would take in the Think Big journey are to get you working towards skills so that you actually, you know, increase your ability at, at, at any particular task. And some people don't take that journey, right? So whether or not it's a conscious thing or whether or not it's an unconscious thing. And I talk a bit about this in the book about kind of narratives and about, you know, holding people back and thinking about um, why we're actually not going on the journey in, in, in the first place. So I think... In some ways, if you haven't had the successes that you want, looking at the book now is probably a good thing to figure out whether or not it's actually your narratives, it's your unconscious that is actually holding you back. And then I think the second is that it's actually down to obstacles that are put in our way unnecessarily. So there are people who have skills, talent and ability who just don't get to where they need to go. And I think, you know, it was the hardest chapter for me to write. I would be very honest about that. But, you know, I speak about the obstacles, um, you know, discrimination, statistical discrimination, um, people kind of just not liking you because you don't necessarily happen to be about them. And again, I try to write about how you can actually navigate around those obstacles. And I think for, for every individual, there's something that's within their control and there's something that's not necessarily within their control. So, for example, if I am somebody who's listening to the show today, who has two children who are really, really young and I'm working a full time job, um, you just don't probably have an extraordinary amount of time in order to make changes that might get you to the next place that you want to be at. But I think the, the book does provide a roadmap 
that would allow you to get there possibly at a, lo- a, a, a lengthier speed than it would take somebody who actually has lots of downtime and, can, and can, 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 can apply themselves most often. But I think one of the first things that I ask people to, do, to reflect in the book is what's the percentages that you think that you kind of hold yourself back with, you know, um, narratives that you're in, you're getting in your own way that perhaps, and I'll talk about this in a second, um, you have a time discount rate that lends yourself to wanting to do things that are kind of pleasurable in the moment, but not pleasurable in the long term. And then I think if you look at the book, the majority of the book is written with that in mind. And then there's one chapter that's really written for actually maybe there's going to be some obstacles that are thrown in your way by other people. And that's happened to me. And if I reflect on my ratios now, I would say it's probably 80 percent of my control where my success goes and 20 percent other people. But I think everyone is going to be at a different level. But the one thing that I say is that those ratios aren't fixed. So if you interview me 10 years ago, I would probably said 40, 60, because I was kind of reliant a lot on other people um, in order to kind of get opportunities to move to, to move ahead. Um, so in some ways, the reason that we don't move ahead is because of ourselves. We don't get out of our own way. And I think the book has an awful lot for, for, in, in it for you. I think the second part is other people will put obstacles in your way. Um, And I think that that's other people's unconscious bias. And then you need to be able to have some tools to navigate around them. And I do give you um, some tools um, in chapter three in order to be able um, to do that. But of course, um, some of that is structural, like we spoke about in the beginning of the conversation. So for people who are kind of disillusioned because they're facing a lot of structural inequality, um, you know, I think focusing on yourself and what you can control is helpful. Um, and also maybe check out the inclusion initiative, which is, is the other side of it, which is about moving kind of, you know, bigger boundaries. Um, yeah. um, and you talk about the difference between the f- a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Do you want to just explain that? Yeah, so that's down to Carl Duick, actually. So um, when I speak about narratives, and when, I, when I was writing my chapter on narratives, I realised that actually, even though people don't label them narratives um, and, and talk about them in the way that I do, this idea that, you know, I'm, 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 I'm what's actually held in my mind about what I can achieve, how, um, what I actually believe about whether or not I can move myself forward, runs through a lot of popular um, 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 psychological approaches would have been shown to work. Mm-hmm. And Carol talks a lot about this idea that if I'm somebody with a fixed mindset, I don't believe that I can actually grow. And for me in Think Big, that comes down to this idea of narratives that I'm not good enough. It's not something that I can do. It's not something that I can fit my time into. Whereas if you have a growth mindset, you're much more tolerant of the learning curve. You're much more tolerant of failing. And actually, you, 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 your narratives or the kind of story that you tell yourself, your narratives are failing is actually good because I'm basically trialing. I'm trying out. And every time I'm failing, I'm actually getting a bit better. Um, and, you know, I think trying to move people um, in their narratives or, 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 as Carol would say, from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset can be enough to get people to kind of rethink their career and think about actually maybe there are things within my control or maybe there's these kind of small things that I could be doing daily to move towards a goal that I never thought that would actually be possible. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought was great was you, there's a lot of bits of the book where you talk about like personal stories and experiences and um, I'd love you to tell the story of Professor Negativity. Oh, yes. I mean, I was I was saying when I wrote about myself in the book, it was extraordinarily hard because it's something that I've never, yeah, really? that I've never done before. So I do, I do hope that it actually that it lands with readers. But yes, um, I moved to the LSE um, in, um, you know, in, in 2011, um, in December, and I was really, really excited. And within, within a few months, I met somebody who was in my network, who was a very, very senior professor, and we got on incredibly well. So we, you know, we, we kind of, I would say we had a friendship. He might have said we had a mentorship, but we, but we you know, he, he, he was always, kind of you know advising me on things and advising me on 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 opportunities and I really kind of felt safe to ask him for advice and then I wasn't really somebody who asked or put myself out there incredibly um you know an awful lot and when I asked him for advice uh, about becoming a senior lecturer, which actually by then I should have been on the track for it maybe two years, three years, if I was moving at an average pace. So this wasn't kind of a conversation where I was reaching for goals that were much, you know, kind of above my station. He said it would be at least five years um, before I would actually make it there. Um, and it might indeed, I mightn't even make it. You know, I mightn't even make it beyond that. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't actually um, say this in the book, but he did actually point to another person 
who had started at NSC around the same time as me and said, look, that person, that's where, that's what you need to be like if you want to, if you want to get ahead. So I was really, really crushed. Um, mm. And I was actually reflecting on it now because I, I keep diaries. I didn't realize that I was crushed. I was really just very deflated. I accepted it as true. Um, and actually, I, I everything went, everything scaled back. So if you even look at my CV around that time, you know, my writing was down, my engagement was down. Um, and I just believed it. And I was kind of thinking, like, what, what am I going to do now? And then it just, I, and I cannot explain, there was nothing that I watched, there was no trigger moment. And it was, it, I wasn't sleeping one evening about it, thinking what I, I was going to do in my career. And I just thought, look, maybe he's got it wrong. So I, I picked three people who I knew, not as well as him, very, very different. So there was no overlap with him or with each other. And I asked them advice. And they all actually gave me much more positive advice. Mm. And they all said that I could, I could, you know, I could make it much quicker than five years. I didn't need to worry about that. And I should really be preparing to go within the next two years. And, you know, and one of them said, buck up. You shouldn't be letting one person, you know, knock you down. Um, but it was really amazing to me the power of one person's opinion who, you know, maybe it was ill thought out. Maybe he thought I was a bit of a joker. You know, sometimes I don't take myself so seriously. Maybe it was because, you know, I, I used to always say that I, know, I, I don't finish projects. I, I, I have a, a, my, my, my attention always gets dragged to the next project. But it does mean that I finish, you know, a, 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 eventually. I don't know what, what actually drove, um, I don't actually know what actually drove him to, to say that, but it really did knock me back. And I think, what I kind of try to do and think big when I bring that up is really thinking about who are our influencers. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I say this, people always say, well, it's important that we take on people's advice. And I think that's absolutely true. But I think if you if you get something particularly as negative as the news that I got, but even something that, you know, is holding you back, you should get a second, third and fourth opinion and, and having those three other opinions, not giving them the context, actually, in which that you're, you're coming to them for. But having those other opinions allows you to think about, is it me or is it actually their biases that are actually a, a allowing them um, to give to give this advice? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I look back, I, I'm, I'm really annoyed at myself that it's, it's slowed me down. But I think now that I'm reflecting on it, there's a lot of learning for me going forward as well. Mm. And I suppose that's a really interesting part of this whole thing, isn't it? It's like you can, uh, I suppose you can do work on yourself to try and think about your own biases, but it's it's often more difficult to really think about other people's biases as well, right? Like, it, you know, it just feels like how are you going to get inside someone's head to, to really work out what's going on? It's really hard. It's really hard. You know, I kind of, because I teach high stakes decisions, I really want people to focus on the type, the, t the occasions where you believe that somebody has held you back. So you look at somebody and, you know, you, you can say, OK, I either believe that they held me back or I can say for sure that they held me back. And then trying to disentangle whether it's something about you or it's something about them. Um, and this comes down to all good decision making. Actually, you know, when I have a win, I have to always remind myself, to actually, I should sit down and say, did I get lucky or is it actually something that I did that allowed me to kind of move that forward? And I think when you have that encounter, doing that is really powerful. I think for two reasons. So firstly, there might be something, there might be more that you can actually control than you think. And I think secondly, if you do think that it's a person's biases, it allows you to tackle them. Now, in the example of Professor Negativity, it was actually quite easy for me to tackle them because I didn't have to go, you know, through the human resources process or have, you know, a kind of a whole battle. And I think most of the times that we encounter people's biases, there are these ways to actually go around them. And it might be going to other people for advice. It might be going to somebody else for help. Or it might be actually, you know, I'm Irish and in all of our sports, we have what we call a backdoor, which means I'm sure people who, who follow the Premier League in UK might like this. If your team isn't doing very well, there's always a second opportunity to get back in and win the competition. Oh. Um, and I think in life there is always that, you know, um, and it's if you have a lot of no's in a row, it can be really disheartening. But I think sitting back and saying, how can I break this cycle? Maybe the people are getting me wrong. And don't forget, you know, some of the biggest thinkers of our time were told no over and over and over again with, you know, um, with, with, with their ideas when they, come, when they come out with them. And Richard Taller, who's one of the fathers of behavioral economics, who won a Nobel Prize for it, talks about not being accepted in economics um, for his ideas. Um, but it, I think it really is about thinking, what can I control? And even if it's not within my control, what can I enlist help from others from, from others for? But it is it is it is the hardest part of people's journeys. It is definitely the hardest part of people's journeys. Yeah. And um, so one of the things that um, 
once you've established a goal you need to be thinking about is how do you make the space in your life to uh, to really make those things happen and you had this lovely part in the book that talks about time audits so i'd love you to talk about some of the the things that you identified that you didn't need and were going to cut out and just that whole principle of time audits i, I just found really really fascinating and made me think i need to probably do some time auditing myself to be honest I thought you'd like that because it really fe it feels like a productivity ninja thing yeah. to actually do a time audit. Um, you know, my biggest barrier anytime I'm asked something is that I always say in my head, I don't have time for it. Um, and I remember being offered a really good opportunity around the time that I was kind of writing the, this book, actually. And I had to go back and do a time audit and figure out where I was wasting my time. And I really encourage people to do this. So it's really about kind of saying, if you're somebody who says to yourself routinely, I don't have time to commit to small steps for my future, take a week and write down everything that you actually did in the week and then look back and see whether or not things were actually productive and what things you can actually cut out. And, you know, in the book, I call these time sinkers, the idea that we actually spend time doing things um, that give us no good whatsoever. Um, and one of my worst for this is actually email. Um, and I, I'm the worst person, not just for checking my email all the time, but for checking it unconsciously. So if I were, you know, if I were on the bus or if I were in a taxi, you might just find me looking at my phone and you would say, why are you looking at your phone? I wouldn't even realize it's in my hand. So my unconscious for email is so powerful. Um, and when I did the audit, it was really scary how many times I've checked. I still haven't been able to nail down the time, but just by not checking my emails every single moment of every single day, I was able to cut back on so much time. The other thing, which I know you've written about actually about meetings is, um, and maybe this is specific to universities, but I found that I was going to lots of meetings where I wasn't adding any value. So if I looked at the minutes later on, there was no sign of my name or, or my initials. And actually, when I looked at the minutes of these meetings later on, there was three people who were doing all of the talking in information that they could have given me by by emails. Mm -hmm. And I managed to kind of say, look, I was spending seven hours a week in these meetings and they were frustrating me afterwards as a waste of time. Let's cut it down. I didn't cut it down altogether because I don't want people to think that I died. So I do just show up to work. But for most the most part, I managed to cut that down to three hours. Um, and the last thing is, that it is, and I actually didn't kind of really realize this about myself, is I think when I did my time order, I must have become addicted to box sets. Um, and, you know, whatever is the TV thing that you have, Netflix, Amazon, I think at that time I had them all, actually. Mm. And I would enjoy watching something um, in the evening three hours in the evening. And then at the weekends, I think it was six hours that I ended up spending. And I think cutting that time down. And, and the whole idea behind the time order is two things, figuring out things that just don't serve you well, which for me was the meetings and the email checking, but also figuring out where you actually have kind of time consistency problems. And I think for me, that's the TV watching. So it definitely gives me utility. Um, so I definitely enjoy it, but all of the enjoyment is in that in in that moment. So if you ask me now what I was watching like two years ago, I wouldn't even remember. So it's not like I I was I'm devoting my time to this thing, and I don't even remember what I what what I spent my time on. And that's really what I want to kind of encourage people to do, to focus on the type of tasks that they might be doing for busy work and cutting those out. And the second is also focusing on things that you might be overspending your time on that give you enjoyment in the moment that you should keep. So I still watch the box sets, but much more mindfully than I did before, um, but to a much lesser extent. And then if you, if you, if, if you pull time from that, for your big thinking journey. You don't get this kind of happiness yank that people get when they totally reconstruct their lives in order to kind of fulfill a goal. And I think at the start of this, I kind of said, you know, this is really for people where they can't upend their lives in, in crazy ways, but they are still ambitious and want to fulfill goals. And identifying time in that way makes you much more likely to stick to the commitments that you've made. Yeah, and you want to still have some time for relaxation and fun and things that you enjoy as well, right? So you can sort of audit these things and then it's like, actually, I'm just going to be more mindful or I'm going to reduce it rather than I'm going to like Absolutely. Turkey, cut it out, right? Um, do you have any tips for people around? So the two things that you mentioned there, emails and meetings, I guess, are, are big pain points for, for most people listening to this. I had Seth Godin on the podcast a little while ago and... Um, I said, you know, how, how do you find the time for all the things that you do? And he said, 
I don't have a TV. I don't go to meetings. That gives me about seven hours every day that everybody else seemingly doesn't have. So do you have any tips for people around email and meetings that feel like, you know, the, the little battles you had to have in your own head with your own stories to, to overcome these, these two huge time sucks? Well, to be honest, once I realized the meeting and the, the, that, you know, that, that in, in, in some of these meetings, my, my voice wasn't being heard. So it was actually pointless being there. It was very easy to give them away because I wasn't that invested with the decisions being made in that. The email was really... Was there not like a political thing, though, of other people expecting you to be there? Because that's the thing that obviously a lot of people face. You would think. I mean, they haven't come after me yet. So maybe, <laughs> right, okay. maybe, after this, maybe after this podcast, I don't know. You would think so. I, I and I, th- I think that I think that's kind of the. I think that's the kind of the how I'm prioritizing my time now is right. you know where I'm where I'm listening to and where I'm needed. I'm very happy to show up. Um, but if I'm going to meetings repeatedly and I you know the, I have nothing to say and the decisions are kind of being made, then I think if those people are competent, then they should make the decisions and kind of let me uh, do something that adds value. So no, you would think. But maybe once this comes out, they will ask me to come back. Um, but no, this, this, the second is the, so the email was, is much harder for me. And I think, you know, as a behavioral scientist, I always think about how can I actually increase the costs of checking my emails? And how can I also um, increase the benefits of not checking the emails? Mm. And the first one is actually easier in this. So for me, I removed emails from my phone. I removed it from my um, computer where I do my main work on. So what, what, I'm, what I'm talking to you on now. And I had an old iPad and that's where I actually checked my uh, emails. Okay. So And I did it just um, twice a day. Um, and sometimes I didn't even do it daily. So I would kind of, I, I you know, I, 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 I changed people's expectations of me responding in a moment, which actually was, was, was painful for some people who were used to me. It, yeah. it didn't. It, that spillover never dawned on me before I before I actually started this, but by changing those costs, I found out that I could actually do much better work actually when I was on a computer, and I wasn't missing the emails as much than if I was able to, for example, click on my email icon here now with you and um uh, and and check my emails. I would have been inclined to do that before we started this, this interview, for example. So I think when you're trying to change time, when you're kind of basically trying to change how you actually devote your time, really focusing on, or any action actually, how can I actually change the costs and benefits so it makes me much more likely to stick to it? Um, And the only thing that I could come up with for benefits, and if you have listeners, I I would love to hear... um, what they have to say. But I did start in the evenings because I found them really hard, you know, uh, and I did start in the evenings writing down the benefits that I actually got from not checking the emails um, so many times, um, so, so, so many times in the day. And eventually it stuck. But I think like anything that, that I'm addicted to, I do need to pay attention to it. So I find myself now, I have my email back on my phone. And before this, I deleted it. You're my first interview for the book, actually. I'm starting. And, and I actually said, you know, I, I took them off for a reason. And I am starting to go back down kind of the, that, um, this, the, that, that slippery slope. I haven't broken it all together. And it's very important for me that the cost of checking emails means it's inconvenient. Um, and the iPad is always in a different room. We're in, we're, in, we're in quite a small house, so it doesn't take that long to walk. But I think as a human, I'm inherently lazy. So it's far away enough that I don't necessarily, um, it's, not, it's not that easy for me to get. But definitely thinking in terms of costs and benefits and carrots and sticks. Yeah, I think, you know, I think as humans, we're all lazy, aren't we? And that's, it, it's a really good way to think about changing any habit, isn't it? It's just like play on that laziness, just make it, like you say, slightly, a slightly higher cost to get to it and that kind of thing. And and suddenly it will make a big difference. Because if you think about, I mean, the big lesson that kind of Danny Kahneman gave in Thinking Fast and Slow is this idea that we have this kind of fast, reactive um, brain where we're kind of doing everything unconsciously and you have this kind of slow, deliberate thinking. And really what you want to do is get to a place where these habits are embedded in the fast brain. So you're no longer you're no longer checking your email on habit. And of course, your fast brain can check your email if it's no longer on your phone. So when 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 you reach for it, you go, oh, no, it's not there. I, you know, I, I can't do it and uh, do it anymore. And I think a lot of the small steps that I'm trying to get people to commit to really leverage those two thinking styles. So in the beginning, you have to be quite deliberate. But over the kind of very short term, actually, as you develop habits, you would automatically become that person who isn't checking their emails, so, um, who, who isn't checking their emails so often, who isn't watching box sets and who actually is, you know, ha- finding more space to think, to be creative or to do whatever it is that you've committed, um, committed to doing in that particular week. 
Yeah. So my way around that that increases the cost is I've so I'm on Android and I use an app called Quality Time, which basically just blocks all of those things at certain oh, times. So Instagram and all those things. And there's a there's an iPhone one called Freedom, and actually the iPhone now has a couple of native things you can do with it that that turns things off at different times as well. But like just that that idea of just increasing the the, the barrier. So for me, like early in the morning, if I'm on my phone and I want to get to email, I have to sit and watch a countdown for an hour to be able to get to email. So, have, you, like, have, you, have you sat and watched? Uh, no, it... never. Because why? Okay. Because you, you watch it for <laughs> half a minute and then you're like, there's no way I'm just going to let my phone sit there and yeah. count down for that. It's just stupid. So it's just one of those things that um, it seems to work for me. So I tend to find I'm kind of more in flow with you know, writing and other things that I'm doing when I'm, when I've got that app turned on, yeah. you know, cause that tends to be like my morning time, my kind of, my more proactive attention kind of time. Um, wanted to pick out a couple of other things from the book. Um, I was like a little magpie going through the book. There's so many little just sort of golden nugget things to, to pull out. Um, the Ben Franklin effect I'd never really come across um, before. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I mean, so there's evidence in behavioural science. And I, again, if you kind of think in terms of the, of the stock of the floor knowledge, there's enough evidence that we can kind of say this actually has weight to suggest that if you ask me for a favour, Graham, um, and I say yes, I'm much more likely to do a second favour for you, um, which is really quite bizarre. So you might actually think that it runs in the other direction, right? So I would think, okay, Graham has used all his his chips today. And I think the root of this is something to do with, with confirmation bias, which is another kind of famous popular rise in behavioural science, which is if I've done a favour for you already, I need to justify myself in some ways that it was actually worth for me doing a favour for you. So maybe it's just that I'm an altruistic person and you're a good guy mm. and that you're kind of worthy of me um, uh, doing doing good gestures. And that I search for that evidence so that the next time that you pop up in my inbox, I'm much more likely to say yes. So this kind of idea of, you know, getting to yeses um, then becomes very, very powerful that actually it isn't the case that when you ask for help or you ask for something that when you get the first yes, that's the end of the story. You actually end up kind of, you know, um, building this reciprocal, um, building this reciprocal relationship. But yeah, I think it's, it, for me, for me, it wouldn't be how you would imagine human behavior running. But when you actually stop to think that how we are as humans and, you know, we have ego and we want to actually kind of look back on our time and, and think that we've actually spent our time well, the fact that we end up doing recurring favors for the same person probably isn't, isn't that unusual. And I guess it kind of gets into almost like a sunk cost thing, right? It's like I'm sort of investing in this person, so now I want to just keep investing and yeah, you know, yeah. already spend that time. Yeah. And getting people to see, getting people to see somebody in a different light, even if they're going totally on the wrong path, is yeah. actually quite hard if they've invested heavily in them. If they've invested heavily in them in, in, in the beginning, um, you know, and I, and I, you know, this this comes down to kind of who's likely to get second chances as well, and whose mistakes are much more likely um, to forgive. And all of these things, I guess, are the small little events that propel our career forwards or propel our career backwards. Yeah, um, and the other one I wanted to just pinpoint quickly is the spotlight effect. Yes, I love the spotlight effect. I mean, I speak about this in companies and they say, should you be talking about that? Because people will realize that nobody's watching them and start doing you know, really terrible things. So there is that negative spillover potentially. But, you know, the spotlight effect um, really kind of sums this idea that when something bad happens to me. So, you know, in kind of in, if I slip on a banana skin to think about something quite farcical, I'm really embarrassed but other people don't really notice because they're too caught up with themselves. And it's the same, you know, if I write a blog and it gets much less likes than, than it did the last time. Or if, even if I go for an interview and I don't necessarily um, get a job in my own company, I have this idea that all of my colleagues are watching me and that they now see me as a failure. When in reality, they're so caught up in their own lives that they've actually moved on. And I find the spotlight effect kind of fascinating for two reasons. So firstly, it's really interesting. But secondly, I think what a lot of what holds people back, Graham, is anticipating failure and anticipating not just how they'll feel, but how other people will think about them when they fail. And for me, it's actually quite freeing to realize that no one really cares if yeah. I, you know, if I if I fail. And actually, if people do notice, most people are sympathetic. Um, but there's something about us that when we feel people are watching us, that for some reason we think that they're going to hold us against us um, in, in, in the future. So for, for people who are who do anticipate failure and it holds them back, they should really embrace the spotlight effect. And, you know, you're going to go forward. You mightn't 
you mightn't do very well, you'll fail, nobody will remember, which is yeah. quite, you know, no one will notice and no one will remember, which, which, is, which is quite nice, actually. It's lovely. It just feels like a really sort of liberating thing. I really like to read it. It does, that. yeah. Yeah. Um, and you also talk about your own procrastination in the book. Yeah. So I figured, you know, beyond busy, very uh, staple topic of conversation, procrastination. So what I'd love to know about that is, obviously, you spend all of your time you know, thinking about biases and, and behavioral science. I'd love to know what that journey has been like through managing your own procrastination and figuring out where it comes from. And, and like, has it, has it changed over the years, sort of how and why you procrastinate? So the horrible thing about behavioral science is actually we have, we have these uh, two categories called sophisticated and naive. And sophisticated means you're somebody who's aware of your bias and naive means that you're not necessarily aware of your bias. And it's been shown with procrastination that just because you're aware of it doesn't mean that you'll actually ever do anything about it. Um, and not even that you'll ever do anything about it, but does it mean that you'll actually succeed in overcoming it? Yeah. And for me, it's a battle. You know, I, 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 there's, there's something in my brain that drags me to new projects. And I'm, I think I'm a very curious person, which I think helps me in my career. Um, but I think my curiosity is also a mask for my procrastination, which definitely kind of, you know, if there's something that I don't want to face, um, then I'm going to be kind of stuck over there. And my, my way around it has been really to be quite mindful of the time of day when I'm the most productive for doing tasks that I procrastinate over that actually need me to think cognitively. Yeah. Um, and those tasks can actually um, be, you know, writing a paper or kind of thinking about kind of what is the next idea, kind of big, big, big idea going to be where I don't necessarily give myself, um, where, where, where I don't necessarily give myself the time. And I commit to that. Um, and for me at the moment, that's in the morning. So I just do it in the morning before most people are up. And the second thing that I procrastinate over a lot are kind of tricky emails that are kind of, you know, politically kind of politically driven or mm. are emotional and I find myself kind of waiting a couple of days sometimes to respond to those and now what I do is I respond to everybody in the day but I do it in the evening um, in this kind of batch process which I think you you recommended um, a long time ago um, but yeah. in those I also put the kind of the type of emails that I've been procrastinating over so it enters the batch um, and, I, and it has to be done first and then other things get done and it's out of the way but it's not something that I can say that I have totally that I've totally battled so I, I will still have days where I can do the most stupid things for a day and you'll ask me what I what I've accomplished and it, it would be nothing <laughs> so it's 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 just you know I kind of talk in, in strengths and difficulties kind of sitting out this idea is your strengths and difficulties sit outside yourself and for me my difficulty is procrastination um, and I see it as my behavior so sometimes I will say look I behaved badly today so I procrastinated a lot or I behaved well today and I didn't necessarily um, procrastinate but being mindful of that has been the only way that I've managed yeah. that I've managed to buck the trend and I think it, it it does walk a line because there's a nice literature that's coming out on boredom which really makes me happy because it plays to my confirmation bias which suggests that people who are bored can actually be more creative um mm. so you know it kind of allows them kind of the space where their mind is idle so some of these kind of ideas they otherwise wouldn't necessarily have so trying to find that you know it's something that I'd, I'd love to think about over the next few years um but trying to find that balance for me at the moment is definitely something that I'm battling with yeah I mean we're very similar on both of those things by the way so I've sometimes talked about uh, me writing about procrastination is just like creating a giant rod for my own back, right? Because then it's like everybody thinks I'm going to be able to completely, you know, just push through procrastination and it never happens. And of course, it still does. But yeah, I have I have very similar uh, tactics to you around that as well. And um, my morning time is also my, my writing time. And so I tend to think of it as I put in Productivity Ninja, the power hour idea, you know, just like one hour yeah. where it's like, you know, the, the the first question around that is, what's the thing that I want people to look back on as me being famous for in three years time, five years time in whatever job I'm in right now. Yeah. And then how do I put at least one hour a day to that thing? And an hour a day, you know, just really adds up. And you talk about in, in, in the book, the idea of this night, these 90 minute sort of dedications to things as well. Right. And I just think having just a regular practice around the thing that is, you know, that you're doing that's most useful is a really powerful thing. And it, and it, and only an hour a day is great news because it means there's so much other time for, for other things, right? 
And the other thing is quite like what you said is, so the other thing that causes me to cross is that I worry. So if something is happening and I really want to solve the problem, that's what would ruminate in my mind. And there's this kind of great expression in behavioral science that, you know, you should really think about in five years time, will the outcome of what I'm worrying about today actually really matter? And then if the answer is yes, okay, keep worrying, keep procrastinating, you know, take the yeah. morning off. But if the answer is no, then it should be filed with, it, 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 it should be filed with other things. So I really like that idea of, you know, what do I want to kind of be known for in five years time? And actually is what I'm worried about today, is that, is, is that serving me in any way? Mm. Um, so a couple of things before we finish then. So you sit on um, the government's, uh, skills and productivity board um, as a government advisor so I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we're what we're doing wrong in productivity on a macro level it, it we always seem to talk about this idea of the productivity puzzle and how to solve it um, what are you, what are your thoughts there that uh, we need to be thinking about what, like how what can we do differently Yes, I mean, we started in December, uh, I should say, and I should say everything that I say now is my opinion more than the opinions of the government. Yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think that this kind of stuff that's out in the public domain, which is really interesting to consider. I think, you know, the UK compared to other countries has pretty bad what we call skill mismatches. So that basically means that people train in things that aren't necessarily um, what employers actually want. So I think kind of from a government perspective, really figuring that out is important. I think as well from the UK perspective, it is problematic that most people kind of make up their minds about what they want to do at 15. Um, so if you think about entry into kind of these major university subjects, a lot of them is decided by A-levels and if you haven't chosen kind of the right A-levels. And I think the new strategy, this kind of levelling up, is really trying to say, actually, it, the world doesn't need to be like that, right? So we can have people going into university at kind of different stages. And what I would actually hope as well is that we open our mind about what actually people need to have had in order to enter particular university qualifications or particular, job, particular jobs. So I've done some work with some companies who always claimed to me that they had a pipeline problem um, for women actually was, 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 there, was, was, was what they um, came to me about. And one of the things that I suggested to them is, look, why don't you just move towards like a task based assessment rather than focusing on everyone needs to be from economics and finance and think about whatever tasks you want people to do. Let them know what they're going to be tested on and see see what what actually happens. And that simple tweak of actually opening it out to anybody who studied history, you know, at not necessarily equal subject classical studies. Those people are smart. They just haven't been studying some of the stuff for a while. But, you know, in, 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 in the way that you can actually self-study and self-learn, they are well able to kind of take these task tests as compared to some people who perhaps have spent time studying economics and, and, and finance. And that kind of opens out this idea of who we actually think about is appropriate for a job. And I think also I would love to open up the idea of who we think is appropriate to be, um, you know, an engineer, uh, a, a computer scientist, a technologist. When I was 15, when I was 17, and probably when I was 25, I didn't have a really great idea about what a lot of jobs were, Graham, to be honest, and what the tasks were. Me so I neither. Had, I had this broad idea. I looked at the telly. If you happen to have that occupation on the telly, I had mm. some idea about what it was, but I didn't. And I think, you know, I think kids kids can't know that and when I did my when we when we launched the inclusion initiative I did some work with a wealth management firm who um, were actually teaching kids about what it means actually to be a wealth manager and I asked them if I could sit in on this so I sat with all these 14 year old kids whose parents happened to be kind of in in the firm and the way it was explained to them I would have wanted to be a wealth manager if I was for I actually wanted to be a wealth manager then and I think about if we can actually bring down those information barriers as well for children yeah. about what are the tasks in particular jobs. I mean, I would not have known what my job is when I was 15. I didn't even know it, it existed. What are the tasks that people do? And secondly, give second, third and fourth chances for people to change their careers once they have the you know, basic level of skills, talent and ability. I think things will be much easier. So I think a lot of the frictions that we're seeing now are that a lot of the things that people are training in isn't what employers want. I think employers have to be more imaginative about what a good person wants. But I think also for people entering courses, there needs to be better information to them about, okay, 
these are the pathways that are open open for you. You know, I, I started off as a computer scientist um, and I've ended up now being a behavioral scientist. And maybe you meet me in 10 years and I'll be doing something else. I think that's the magic of the world that we live in. But we need to get information to people so that they actually know that those options are open to them. Because um, I, I, I mean, yeah. in some ways I learned very late in life about the options that are open, that are open to me. And from working in schools, I know for sure that kids don't have a really good idea about what are the actual tasks. You know, if you ask them to imagine an economist, it sounds really, really boring. But some of the economists who I work with at the LSE do the most fascinating work. You know, they're in Africa, you know, working on field trials um, to try to think about how to actually make people's lives better. Um, they're helping with macroeconomic policy to help us, you know, through COVID. Um, and that kind of width, I don't think we give to kids um, through career, um, you know, through, through career guidance. I don't know what you were told you should be, but I know I was told that I should work in a bank, and I wasn't told anything more than I didn't know whether I was going to be the teller or whether I was going to be somebody running that bank. But that was the kind of information that I was given in school, and 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 we haven't moved too far beyond that actually. Um, yeah. So I think for skills, it's about giving people information about what type of skills are valuable, so we can so the individual can choose if they're pursuing income then they can actually choose a skill that they know that there would almost be a certain job. But more than that, reimagining what actually these career paths career paths look like. Because um, I think if you follow some of, you know, if you follow even some of your work in five years, you know, in 10 years time, you can actually really reimagine what you might be. So we can see more engineers entering at 30, 40 and perhaps, you know, even 50. Yeah. I mean, this might be an impossible final question then, but just based on that, because it feels like, you know, I mean, I so just to backtrack to your question. So you said, what what was I told I should be? And I don't think I was ever told that I should be anything until like I certainly not by my parents. And then the only time that ever really entered my consciousness was going for the compulsory careers advice session um, at university. And it just struck me that the only people that uh, I was being introduced to were the sponsors of the careers fairs, which were basically yeah. all the big finance firms and uh, and law firms and stuff. And it just didn't feel like what I wanted to do. But I got all that way through the system without anyone really sort of pushing me down a particular rabbit hole or whatever. And it kind of feels like what you're saying is we need to open that up so that we don't have, you know, this, this uh, sense that at you know, 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, we're, we're having to pick the next 40 years of our lives. And we want that, that, you know, more agility and more ability to, to move around and adapt as, as the world changes around us as well. So I guess the, the final question, which might be impossible is, do you think there are particular skills that are going to be more valuable because they're so transferable? And so as the world changes and we can hop around, are just going to be useful wherever we end up, you know? Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, the obvious one to pick is digital skills. So that's expanding. And I think that's something that we have to kind of do more of in schools. Um, I think less popular is this notion of soft skills, um, which I'm really interested in. So, you know, it's been shown, for example, that um, if you have people who have really good social skills and they also have good cognitive skills, including good tech skills, they have a wage premium in the labour market. Right. Whether or not they're happier, we don't know, which which I think is also um, a question worth asking, but they definitely have a wage premium. Um, but also there's all of these other skills. So, for example, adaptability and resilience um, are things that actually, I think, came in really handy for people during COVID. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but some of my colleagues who were doing incredibly well before COVID really struggled with it. Um, and some of, the, some of the people who actually were uh, ended up having kind of these benefits because they just really adapted and kind of said, look, I can't control my external environment. So I'm going to kind of control my, in, my internal work in, um, environment. Um, I think leadership skills, like really thinking about who I am as a leader. And I think also how I actually relate, relate to other people. You know, we kind of talked a little bit about it in this, in, in, in the start when we talked about the inclusion initiative, but I think we used to have a world where a dominant extrovert who was confident, who was risk loving, was always the person who was going to get to the top of a re, uh, an organization. And that's changing now. And I think it's kind of changing towards kind of collaborative, humble leadership. And I think we can teach those skills in school. Um, I think some of the reluctance at the moment is that we don't yet know how to teach them well. So I can't give yeah. you a curriculum today that's evidence-based. 
But I think unless we start and we start kind of doing it in the spirit, actually, of behavioral science and evaluating them and looking at effects and being honest. Um, and I do worry. So I, I'm a big proponent of soft skills. I worry slightly because a lot of the evidence suggests that soft skills always augment the outcomes that we actually look at which really suggests to me publication bias, but also very often the person who evaluates the programme has created the programme. So there's kind of this weird incentive to actually show that it worked. So I think once we get around that teething problem, okay. taking kind of... And I think even, even what we've been talking about today, you know, time management, procrastination, being agile in your career... Um, my, you know, my, my, my wish for people, because I think I've benefited from it, is that you can change kind of careers and kind of change the tasks that you're doing regularly. But I also think actually to earn a living, it's going to become much more necessary. I think, you know, we, yeah. we as people in general, whether we choose to or not, are having much more careers. And I think giving people kind of autonomy over that choice becomes really, really important at, at, at this time in the world. So definitely more tech and digital. Um, but I really like soft skills. And, and, and the other reason why I like them is because actually they've been shown to be malleable across our lifetime. So whereas it's harder to teach people as they get older digital skills, it's very easy um, to teach them and to get them to improve on things like creativity, uh, adaptability, you know, curiosity. Um, so I think the next phase of my research is actually going to be figuring out which are the most important. Um, so really, is it social skills? Because that's just being picked out of a big lump. Or are things like curiosity, which people are, are researching a lot more now, mm -hmm. um, are things like adaptability, are they important? And if so, then the next part is who's teaching them well? Can, you know, can, can, can we actually evaluate them? And I think that would be, I'd love to democratise it. And yeah. um, when I spoke about the kids and the wealth management, it was very unfair. Like these are wealthy parents yeah. giving their kids this information. I would love it if it was just free where everybody could, um, where everybody could download it. And that has been my one sticking point with the inclusion initiative, that everything that we'll produce will be there for people to consume. But I would love if we could get to a place where lots of other people have put on, you know, materials for kids to upskill with respect to soft skills, regardless of, of where they come from, and make it easier for teachers to actually teach them um, in the school environment as well. Yeah, well, it uh, sounds like you're doing some good work at breaking down the ivory towers. So, um, yeah, it feels like you're just Thank at the you. fore forefront of so many interesting um, uh, you know, pieces of work and so many things that just impact our economy and our lives. And it could and be a symptom of my procrastination as well. I <laughs> would say that I now actually have a researcher who's 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 heading up every project. So, to the extent that they procrastinate less than half one object, <laughs> we make much more progress. I think. <laughs> so I just want to finish just just because because of that, just to wish you well in all that work because it just feels like there's uh, there's a lot that you're doing that um you know we we really depend on. So. Um, Dr. Grace Norton, just so great to have you on Beyond Busy. Do you want to just at the end, just tell us where people can find the book and connect with your work and everything else? Yes. So, I mean, Think Big is out on the uh, 25th of March. So you can find it in any um, good uh, good book, book tellers. Bookshops that are open. <laughs> yes, any bookshop, any bookshop that is open. At the LSE, we support the independent book um, store called Hackney Store. So if you happen to be in London, do drop by there if it happens to be open on March the 25th. Or you can also order online. Um, but also, um, I mentioned the inclusion initiative at the start of this um, at the start of this video. You can follow me on Twitter at Grace Lord and underscore to learn more about the inclusion initiative or jump on um, LSE's website. And do keep in touch. My email is there. And, and I do answer my own email, not as frequently as I used to before, but you will get a relatively speedy return. So I would love to hear from you Perfect. if I've said anything that interested you. Yeah, we'll put all that in the show notes on YouTube and on getbeyondbusy.com and wherever you Brilliant. get podcasts. But Grace, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organisations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programs and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You want to sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you want to buy some of my books? Or do you just want to find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.